So I'm assuming that many of you answered yes to the question asked in the title of this video before you even clicked on it. And I'm not here to convince you otherwise. And I'm not going to go down the well-worn path of how the costs and benefits of marriage just don't stack up for men anymore. But neither do I want to dismiss that point of view. So let's just get it out of the way. And the argument is what? That men simply are giving up hope on marriage because um, they're feeling beaten down? No, I don't think they're giving up on hope on marriage. I think what they're doing is they're looking at it, the cost reward. Men look at things in terms of cost analysis. And the penalties for marriage are so high and the rewards now are so low. First of all, there's, there's legal costs of marriage. There are so many men now who are just saying, you know what, it's just not worth it to me. I'm going to be stuck paying the alimony. I'm going to be stuck paying for child support. And it's not just legal reasons. It's also psychological ones where men feel that um, basically, they don't really have rights in marriage. Women hold all the cards now in reproduction and all kinds of things, and men don't. And that's a perfectly valid point of view, and I've read Dr. Helen Smith's book, Men on Strike, and it's well worth a read. And as I've noted in previous videos, the percentage of young men that think marriage is important has also decreased over the last 20 years or so. And of course, the number of people getting married is now at the lowest point in history, although it does seem to have bottomed out in the last few years. Then there's divorce rates, which have also been coming down since their peak in the 1980s, and it also seems to have bottomed in recent years. This chart shows quite clearly that people married in the 90s and 2000s are less likely to get divorces than those that married in the 70s and 80s. However, there is a segment of the divorce demographic that has grown over the past 20 to 25 years, and that's the 50 and over category. This chart from the Pew Research Center shows that the divorce rate for the 50 plus category has doubled since 1990. Now note this is the number of people that divorce per thousand, not to be confused with the divorce rate you commonly hear that about roughly 40% of marriages end in divorce. Now while this may seem like a doubling from a low base, another way to conceptualize this trend is that in 1990 fewer than 1 in 10 divorces occurred in the 50 and over age group, whereas in 2010 the 50 and over age group accounted for more than one in four of all divorces. So why might that be? Well, one simple explanation is that people live longer. Go back 50 or 60 years ago when life expectancy was about 65, you basically worked your whole life and then croaked it. Since 1990, whilst divorce rates for older Americans have been going up, widowhood has remained the same amongst men and actually gone down for women. Today people retiring at 65 now have to plan and think about what they're going to do for the next 20 years or possibly more. The book Calling It Quits written in 2007 detailed this phenomenon. Although it does rely on a lot of anecdotal accounts, the main reasons cited are that people are living longer, have more disposable income and want their later years to be more satisfying, something they didn't have to contemplate half a century or more ago. Of course, there is the empty nest phenomenon and the fact that women are more financially independent. After all, women are initiating approximately two-thirds of divorces, although that won't stop them from abdicating responsibility for their actions, as I detailed a couple of weeks ago, the growing number of women that are finding themselves homeless in their 50s and 60s. Then of course there is the tradcon argument that women are being duped into thinking careers should take precedence over family life and that when a lot of women turn around and look for a man in their mid to late 30s, their options are limited and their ability to get pregnant starts to fall off a cliff. Lauren Southern gave a lecture on this topic recently and this is not an endorsement of that lecture. I'm not a big fan of traditional conservatism or at least the kind that has some nostalgic yearning for a bygone era that we can never return to. So this is where I want to make a departure from the usual arguments based on a recent podcast I listened to on the science of extending life. And to be clear, this is not about living forever, but making people more healthier for longer, which will result in longer lives, but with much less disease and disability. Because what's the point of living to 120 if you're just going to be as debilitated as the current 80-year-old, but just for another 40 years? And the focus here is not on the life-extending technologies themselves, but their implications for society and ultimately marriage and families. So this short excerpt comes from an episode of the A16Z podcast that was recorded back in April this year. There is also a cost to, I mean, say we did all add 
40 years to our lives, you know, which would be amazing. But you have a generation then on the planet that's hanging around for much longer using resources and food supply. And also, well, retirement I mean, gets pushed back 40 years. Really? No, no, that'd be yeah. because of 40 productive years. Oh, interesting. No, actually, they, you could think of the other way around that when you're 70, if you're youthful and 70, the amount of information expertise you've gathered uh, and to apply that in a way that had the energy of a, of a 30 year old, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I often wish I knew now what I knew when I was 20 and all the things I could do. Right. Uh, imagine now uh, making that really possible. That's true. But, but I, th I think the point you raise is an important one, which is how does society change? If we add 40 years to right, life, it right. would have to change. I, you know, it, it's interesting because really over the last century plus, we've doubled human life expectancy. Right, already. Already yeah. doubled. But all of those extra years have been added at the end. So we still get married at the same time, have kids, <laughs> retire. That's all stayed exactly the same. And now we have these, and we, what we don't want to do as a society is just keep adding them on at the end. Because I think there really has to be this global shift you know, even as we're extending lifespan just by what is happening naturally. The interesting thing about this is that if it really is extending health, you could imagine that the age in which women can bear children could be extended out. Yes. That would be a very different world. And actually, that would have a huge impact in terms of uh, um, women in the workforce and their ability to, to have children and so on. It could have fundamental uh, implications in very, very positive ways. So first thing, it's not completely accurate to say that marriage and the age women have children hasn't changed over the last century. It used to be early 20s that women on average got married and had their first child. It's now the late 20s. But obviously they're talking about the idea that if 60 is the new 20 or 25, then a woman could have what is considered a long career by today's standards and then still be as attractive and fertile as someone in their 20s. Now the prospect of raising kids in your 70s sounds ridiculous, but if your 70s are now the new 30s, then why not? But getting back to the original question, what does this do for marriage? If older people today are bailing out of marriage because they're bored with being with the same person and want to live a more fulfilling life in their later years, what will it mean for marriage if you live to be 120 on average? The idea of a partner for life is already daunting for most, but how about if you live to 120? Perhaps instead of talking about a partner for life, we'll start talking about partners for life. One for the first half, one for the second half. And not just because you got divorced, but by design. And what about those type of marriages that are the cheaper to keeper type? Well, if you're thinking that way at 50, you might be more inclined to get divorced because you know you've got another 50 years to rebuild your life if you're going to work until you're 90 or 100 years of age. Anyway, this is obviously all very speculative. It was designed to spark some discussion. So what do you think will be the consequences of life extension technologies on marriage, families, and work life? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. See you next time.